Hi, I'm Jeff Raines, the pastor of First Baptist Church Shreveport. I'm so glad you're listening today to the First Baptist Podcast. We worship every Sunday at 1030 a.m. at 543 Ockley Drive in Shreveport. There is always a place for you. Renee and and choir, that was beautiful this morning, and we've already had a a great morning of worship and Bible study. I always enjoy walking around and and sticking my head in the Sunday school classes and seeing our our gatherings, and I want to say a special thank you to our our Sunday school teachers. I, I don't say that enough, but you work so hard in presenting God's Word week after week after week, and it's such an important role in our church and our Bible study classes are a great opportunity um, to just get to know one another and study God's Word together. So thank you to all of our teachers for that. I, I did have a couple of you uh, congratulate me on Baylor actually getting a football game win. I won't say too much. I see a few Texas Tech grads out there, but it was an exciting day uh, yesterday for Baylor. We need one or two of those a season. Um, which may be all we get. So, a little, turn to your Bibles uh, to Exodus 20, and as we get started, I'll, I'll pray uh, as we start to look to God's Word. Um, God, I, I pray that you would speak to us today from your Word and your truth, and that you would shape our hearts um, by your heart, by your desire, by your truth. In your name we pray, amen. Well, what's job one for us as Christians? We, we could come up with a pretty good list about what is most important for us. What, what is the number one task for us as believers? Um, maybe it's to love other people or, or tell about Jesus or baptize or make disciples. There's lots of ways that we could summarize what the Bible tells us is our job as followers of Jesus. Uh, here's a, a summary that Jesus gave us, his last words to his disciples before ascending to heaven. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses, both in Judea, in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. That's our job. That's what Jesus has told us to do. That's what Jesus wants to find us doing when Jesus returns, is be my witnesses witnesses. So for the disciples who walked with Jesus, they were to tell the story about what they heard and saw and were a part of. And for us who believe in Jesus, because they passed that testimony down and it's passed all the way to us, it's our job to continue to speak. We add our voices to that testimony and that witness, and we don't have to be theological experts, but we just have to have a story about how Jesus has worked in our lives and be willing to tell other people that story. So what needs to be in place to do that job? Uh, First, we need to have an authentic experience with Jesus Christ of our own. And secondly, our life needs to have a certain consistency with that message. So we can't speak to the amazing, transforming power of Jesus if we ourselves, our lives, are still the same old mess that they've always been. Um, And Jesus so often pointed out hypocrisy uh, among so many of the religious leaders of His day. And, And the world doesn't want to hear from us when all they see is anger and bitterness and rage and power hungry and and unrestrained lust, and all the other stuff that's so common out in the world, we can't be Jesus' witnesses when our lives are indistinguishable from everyone else. But here's the other thing that's important for us to remember. We can't be faithful witnesses to Jesus if we are false witnesses about everything else. Um, we, We can't expect people to believe the truth of Jesus when we speak things that are false throughout the rest of our lives. And that's the topic for today. As a part of our series this year, 40 Steps Closer, uh, we're looking at those basic teachings the Bible gives us for following God, for being Christ-like people, for being more like Jesus at the end of the year than we are today. And so we've worked through some of the basic teaching of Scripture, the Great Commission, the, the Lord's Prayer, the Great Commandments, love God, love your neighbor, And as a part of that, we've been working through the Ten Commandments. 
Um, so we, we've talked about idolatry. We've talked about the name of the Lord, about the Sabbath. Uh, uh, worked through um, the Ten Commandments over the course of this year. Two weeks ago, our, our sermon title was Stop Stealing Stuff. Of course, that's important. A basic message. And today's feels so basic to us um, because it's a message we've heard since we were children. But here's Exodus 20, verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Uh, so two kinds of witnesses here uh, given to us in Scripture. We are called to be witnesses to Jesus, be my witnesses, and we are forbidden from bearing false witness against others. So our action step today for our 40 steps closer is fully commit to the truth. Fully commit to the truth in our lives. This is something that's within our reach. It can be hard, um, but fully commit to the truth. We can't be compelling witnesses to Jesus if we are false witnesses with others. It's a little bit like how the Bible connects loving God and loving other people. You know, 1 John is so clear on this point. If someone says, I love God, and yet he hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. Uh, for the one who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Uh, if we love God, that's saying we will love the people that God has placed around us. Um, and when it comes to our speech, we can't, be, uh, we can't expect to be effective um, in sharing the truth of Jesus if we are false witnesses about other people. So the Ten Commandments, it, it tends to focus on the big picture uh, with all of these. So it, it just says, you shall worship no other God. It doesn't go into all the different varieties of idolatry. We find that later. Um, or, or it says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It doesn't go into all the various uh, minutia of Sabbath law. The rest of the law does that. But the Ten Commandments, it's just giving us this punchy list. You know, here's, here's the big picture ideas of uh, what we are to follow. But with this one, it's interesting because I almost feel like we could come up with a broader category of truthfulness um, than, uh, than it gives us in this verse. For example, we could, you know, we could say, well, maybe it should just say, thou shalt not lie. So that would capture it, wouldn't it? Whether it was in court or on your taxes or with your friends or whomever. And the Bible certainly speaks to our lying again and again. Proverbs, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, uh, but those who deal faithfully are His delight. Uh, or in the Proverbs, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run to evil, a false witness uh, who declares lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. Or, or Zechariah says it so clearly, these are the things which you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment for peace at your gates. Let none of you devise evil in your hearts. Do not love perjury, for all these things are what I hate, declares the Lord. Uh, and then in the New Testament, Colossians, do not lie to one another. You have stripped off the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. Uh, so we know that lying is wrong. Scripture speaks to that very directly. But it's interesting that this commandment focuses in on this more specific category of false witness, of perjury. But think about how their justice system depended on witnesses. There's no DNA evidence for crimes. There were no body cameras. There's no security camera footage to, to find out the truth of what someone is saying. Um, justice depended almost entirely on eyewitness accounts. And so the false witness could destroy lives. And of course, that's still true today. Uh, there, there was a famous case in history. It was a deeply polarized time, and the population was divided, and neighbors were uh, divided, and even family could be on opposite sides. And there was this man, he was evidently a pious and religious man, who had uncovered a plot to assassinate the leader and overthrow the government. And he had lived among this other side, and, and he started naming names, and these were prominent names. 
uh, political, religious leaders, people he had known, and they were an unpopular minority anyway, suspected of being loyal to a foreign power. So people were very ready to believe what he had to say. And he just had this phenomenal memory for who had said what and when, and he had handwritten notes and hysteria built and built over this whole affair. People were jailed. 22 people were executed based on his testimony. Uh, this, this man's name was Titus Oates. This was 1678 in England, and it was called the Popish Plot, where supposedly Catholics were about to rise up and, and murder their Protestant neighbors and assassinate the king. And at, at one point in the kind of conspiracy hysteria, anyone even suspected of being a Catholic was driven out of, of London. And so Oates became famous through this. He received a pension from the state, but inconsistency started showing up, and his own background really wasn't hold, held up to much, it, it wasn't holding up to scrutiny. And before long, he was convicted of perjury and confessed he had made it all up. Um, it, and so he was sentenced to life in prison um, with the addition that once a year he would be brought out and whipped from one end of London to the other. A false witness is a serious issue. I, I saw a story this week, a Baptist pastor, seminary professor, pled guilty to lying over um, investigation into sexual abuse at the seminary, just potentially facing prison time. I, I think the, the importance of false witness in the Ten Commandments here stems from its connection with the justice system. False witnesses ruin lives. Innocent people get convicted. Guilty people get off through bribes. God cares deeply about justice uh, and about people getting a fair and honest shake when it comes to life and the law. So this is a sin that really strikes at the heart of culture. So all the way to ancient times, this was taken so seriously. In fact, one of the earliest punishments for perjury was that you would, be, you would face um, the punishment for the crime the person was accused of, that, that you were a part of the testimony here. But as we put this action step into practice for us, I think we can certainly follow what Scripture says in expanding this beyond a courtroom setting. Um, how can we be people of the truth um, throughout our lives in all circumstances? Uh, of course, it's easy to come up with scenarios where maybe it's best not to tell the, the unvarnished truth. Uh, I served in a, a church once where there were two best friends, and one was a fantastic soloist. She had this beautiful voice. And then her best friend also loved to sing solos, but she was terrible at it. I mean, it was cringe-worthy every time. And I don't know how it got to this point, but it had gone on so long that, that it felt like you couldn't tell her that she couldn't sing. And so maybe someone early on should have pulled her aside and said, I think your spiritual gifts lie, you know, something like that, a good honest conversation would have been really, really helpful, but at this point, she was the topic of a lot of conversation after every solo, and I, I came up with a good response when I saw her in the halls after she had sung. I would tell her, you didn't seem nervous. You know, that's a fair, that's a true thing. Um, so if I ever tell you that... <clears throat> And of course, we can come up with other scenarios. You know, the, the French family's hiding Jews and the Nazi is knocking on the door. Of course, you don't tell the truth. But that's really not how we face the truth from day to day. There, there is a pattern or a habit to our speech, and we need to practice truth in the small things so that we're ready to tell the truth in the bigger things. Jesus spoke to this in the Sermon on the Mount that Sarah read earlier about swearing oaths. And evidently, people, when they really, really, really wanted you to believe what they would say, they, they wouldn't say, swear to God. A good Jew would never say that. But they would swear by Jerusalem and by the Holy of Holies or the temple or the high priest's golden robes. And it's almost like a, an incantation of magic. I'm going to name all these powerful things to back up what I'm saying. Jesus says, why do, you need, why do you feel the need to do all that? Just tell the truth. Just let your yes be yes, your no be no. And maybe you've known people through the years who just, you know, they tell so many whoppers that 
whenever their testimony about something comes up, you say, well, you got to take that with a grain of salt. What's more tragic than that for that to be said about us? You have to consider the source, um, but lying in small things leads to an erosion of trust. Uh, and so we don't need to be trying to swear by this, that, or the other. Just tell the truth. Th there's barriers to telling the truth, I think. Um, one barrier is our pride. You know, when we get caught in something, maybe it's even something so simple as, did you, did you do the report? A and you say, oh, yes, 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 I, I, I emailed that. Maybe I, I may be having email problems. You know, well, you can just be honest and say, no, I forgot I didn't do the report. We're afraid of that blow to our pride. Or we exaggerate. Uh, our background, we exaggerate our resume, exaggerate wh whatever it is to, to puff ourselves up, make ourselves look better in the eyes of others. But remember, what's job one for us as believers? It's to lift the name of Jesus up, not our own name. Um, so pride can be a barrier to telling the truth. Uh, another barrier to telling the truth is it's really fun to gossip about other people and tear them down. And that's a for, form of false witness, especially when we don't know the, the truth of the situation and we pass along things that, that aren't true. And there's this phenomenon where, with gossip where if you're talking to someone and you don't know what to talk about with them or maybe you feel insecure in the conversation, well, find another person to run down. That's a great way to bond with somebody else. But we need to resist that in, in our language. Uh, resist gossip and cling to the truth. And then another barrier to um, truthfulness today is that honestly we live in a culture that is just swimming in lies. Um, advertisers lie to us to get our money. They, they promise one thing, give us something else. We feel burned by the lemon we get stuck with, less trusting, more cynical. A friend of mine in ministry, he's a, an education minister at a, a church, and he was getting a new roof, and there was this one issue with the roof, and he talked to the roofer, and the roofer said, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, I'll take care of that. Of course, of course, of course. He didn't take care of it. And, and, and then it caught, he had to, my friend had to redo the roof. He was thinking about suing this man, and he, he called him and said, I don't understand. We shook on that. You said you'd take care of it. You gave me your word. And, and the man said, well, my word doesn't mean squat. I mean, he liter literally said that to him. My word doesn't mean anything. And so we can feel burned by that in business transactions. And, and then we're in the midst of, uh, um, a co of course, a political season where the line between truth and lies is just so bewildering. And, and what makes it hard today is just about every source feels so biased that, that it's all just going to be spin one way or another to, to lift up my team or tear down the other and then add in AI uh, and the, uh, you can have pictures or video manipulated to show whatever you want to show. Did you know, did you hear that a middle-aged Baptist preacher won the Boston Marathon? I saw it on the internet. There's the picture right there. Uh, I actually just, I made that with AI. I just said, middle-aged Baptist preacher. <laughs> it looks real, hey, and that seems harmless. Um, but even in, re you know, in this election season, there, there have been AI-generated pictures of you know, the, my candidate looking heroic, the other candidate doing something destructive, and it gets passed around and spread, and, and somebody generated it and knew it was a lie, and they sent it anyway. And, and, and I'm so perplexed by this, but it's just you know, maybe this attempt to win people over. There is a very troubling idea that I hear a lot, even from, from Christians, um, that the ends justify the means, <coughs> that what's important is, is power, and if we have to lie or pass along a lie or cheat or steal to get it, then that's what we do. And, and even preachers are, are promoting this idea, but to be a Christian is to submit to Jesus Christ as Lord. And, and that means we submit to what He said, to the kind of life He called us to live. We submit ourselves to his example, and he never, ever, ever in his life or in his teaching said that we should set aside his teaching in order to gain power. He never said it. Um, so here's a good application of our action step today. Don't share something unless you know it to be true.
unless you've done the work to make sure it's true. It may not seem like a big deal. You may trust the, the person that sent it to you, um, but you need to take your name seriously. If your name is associated with this, and you need to take your job as a witness to Jesus Christ seriously, because if you are sharing and passing along things that are false, that diminishes your credibility when it comes time to share about things that are true about Jesus Christ. Um, so don't be naive. Do the work to see if it's true before passing along so many things that we find on the internet are generated in Russia or China, and they're specifically generated to divide us. They don't care if it's left or right. They just want us to hate each other and not trust anything. So don't share unless you've done the work to see if it's true. And don't give up on the truth. Um, one of the, the kind of shameful things that I, I, I think is happening today is lies just repeated and repeated and repeated with the hope that people will eventually believe it or won't believe anything. Um, but that's not what we are to do. And here's what the Bible tells us, that, that we have the Holy Spirit within us. Here's what Jesus said, I, I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper so that He may be with you forever. The helper is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. So we may find ourselves in a culture full of lies, whether it's from family or friends or marketers or salesmen or politicians, but we don't have to give in to that because we have a different spirit within us, the spirit of truth, and we have a, a different calling in our lives. So we should never engage in false witness, whether it's to protect our pride, whether it's to lift ourselves up, whether it's to gain an advantage or, or knock enemies down a notch. Everyone else may be doing it, but we have a, a higher calling in our lives when it comes to our witness and testimony. We are to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. So flowing from that, what is connected with our name, what's coming from our mouth, needs to be true. When Jesus was before Pontius Pilate, who was a political lackey of Rome, he, he was just squeezing whatever he could get out of Israel before moving on to a better post somewhere. He's questioning Jesus, how he ended up in this spot condemned. <coughs> and Jesus told him, You say correctly, I am a king. For this purpose I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate, a product of a world full of lies, responded to him, what is truth? Pilate captures the spirit of our age, too lazy, too self-absorbed, too power-hungry to be bothered. But we know that the living truth was standing right before him. And Jesus tells us how to commit to the truth right here by listening to Jesus' voice. So if we want to cling to the truth, cling to Jesus Christ. Now, there are all kinds of voices spinning all kinds of things out there, but set your hearts and set your focus on what Jesus did, on His life, His calling, His teaching. He calls us to truth, and there is, there is nothing. Uh, there, there is nothing in this world or in the next that should sway us or be a greater call than the call that Jesus Christ has laid on our lives. That is the center. That is the heart. That is the truth. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to have the courage to stick to your truth that's revealed to us. Um, Lord, that we would not be swayed uh, from one side to the other, that, that we would not amplify what is false, but that what, what comes from us would be what is, is good and true and from you. So Lord, help us to be effective as witnesses that our lives would so clearly point to your kingdom, toward your grace, and toward your truth. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you for listening today to the First Baptist Shreveport podcast. You can learn more about our church and watch the services at firstbaptistshreveport.org.